Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Women Who Rock Investigate, where branding just got even better for women. Our media source provides case studies in the areas of health, policy and government, human resources, and more. Our experts are handpicked with credible information to validate the latest in these studies. Join us each Tuesday at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time after Women Who Rock with Success. Now, let's go to the show. Hi, and good morning. This is Diane, and welcome to Women Who Rock uh, with Success Investigates. And thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, We have an exceptional panel. We're still talking about criminal law, criminal law justice. um, And we're also going to dig in a little bit further, and then we're going to go inside the prison institution with two um, offenders that um, were released. And so um, before we begin the show on today, um, we want to um, advise everyone that some of the um, um, information that will be coming out is going to be sensitive and it is going to be in regards to some institutions and the individuals do have um, valid proof of what they are um, will be discussing um, on today on the um, podcast. But with that being said, uh, we want to make sure that our comments are not as biased, but we want to make sure that we are all aware of um, that some of the content may be a little sensitive. So we're going to go ahead and start introducing the panel. We first have um, one of our veteran attorneys um, that is always on the show. I think it's his, about his eighth time. And so he is uh, the principal owner of uh, Friedman Law Firm, and it is criminal defense attorney um, Alan Friedman. We also have attorney, uh, criminal defense attorney uh, Chris Parker, and I'm going to let him introduce a little bit more about his um, uh, group and um, a little bit about him because this is his first time. We also have um, on the show uh, today is um, a former uh, offender that was uh, released, and he's going to be sharing some information. That is Stephen Ogden, and we have uh, also Laura Wetzel. And so she has a very impeccable story that um, she will be sharing. And then also this will um, give them also an opportunity to be able to ask questions and Q&As with the attorneys as well. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the show. Good morning, Diane. Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, Chris, are you on the line this morning? Okay, so we're going to start with uh, we're going to start with you, Alan, as as always. And so um, let the rest of the panel uh, describe to the panel a little bit about you, and um, and we'll go from there. We'll go around from there. Okay, Diane. Um, welcome, everybody, and it's great to be back uh, with you, Diane. Uh, you're a great inspiration to me. I, I, I love what you're doing in, in the podcast, giving voice to people who are oppressed by our prison state. Uh, I'm a criminal defense attorney. You know, I, I, I play a small part in trying to correct the injustice. You know, as we see today in our society, there's a great movement afoot to um, – address uh, what's perceived as, as a lot of injustice uh, throughout the system from the way police officers arrest people, the way uh, people of color are treated, um, and uh, the, the prison system itself. Uh, I represent people who are accused of crimes, and I, I'm here to say that, that not only are, are people of color are treated unfairly in a criminal justice system, but a lot of people of all different ethnicities are treated unfairly in a criminal justice system and on wrongfully accused and wrongfully convicted. And a lot of times people uh, don't get a good defense. They have to wind up serving years in jail for crimes they didn't commit. And if you, if you follow the news in any, any newspaper throughout the United States, you'll see every week just about, you'll see a story about some individual that served 20 or 30 years in jail and then, DNA evidence was found in their case, and they were exonerated, and the state said, gee, sorry, you had to do 20 or 30 years in jail for a crime that you never did, right? So that's why I'm in, that's why I, I'm in this game, is, is to try to prevent those situations before they occur, 
And as you know, Diane, I've, I've said this many times on your show, um, we're living in a prison state, and we have way too many people locked down in the United States. We have 4% of the population of the world. We have 20% of the prison population. This is, first of all, un- unfair, unjust, and mm-hmm. it's a tremendous waste of resources. I think we should be educating youths instead of incarcerating them. Uh, mm-hmm. We're giving them a Ph.D. in how to be a criminal. And we're uh, making it very difficult for them to get jobs when we need to be really competing against other nations like China, et cetera. So um, I think it's time to reexamine our priorities in the United States and hopefully all of the movements and voices that are being heard in the streets and all across America today will lead to systemic change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Chris, are you on? Because I think that you are, but you're trying to not. I can't hear you. Okay, so we'll go to Stephen. Good morning, Stephen. And so tell the audience a little bit about you. Okay, well, my name is Stephen Ogden. Uh, I'm 37 years old, and I've been incarcerated on and off since I was 12 years old. I've never committed a violent crime. Um, my last sentence was 16 years. Uh, for possession with intent to distribute for a bag that was in a woman's makeup case. Um, I went to trial. She testified that it was not mine. And mm-hmm. I got a 16-year prison sentence. Oh. Um, yes. Uh, I went all the way to trial. I was pro se. I had, uh, as your guest just spoke, about not having proper representation. My public defender refused to represent me at trial. She said that she would not represent me, and um, because of my past, uh, I asked to go pro se because they wouldn't give me a an attorney. Um, I continued on. Um, the ju- the jury deliberated for two and a half days on a simple possession case. Came back with a verdict, and I got 16 years. Mm. Um, I went back on a most recently. I went back on a parole violation. Um, I had relapsed and used. Um, Colorado Senate bill says that I was only supposed to get 30 days in prison or 30 days in the county jail. Actually, they, um, gave me the remainder of my sentence of my, uh, sentence illegally put me in and for four and a half years, but I was lucky and I had a good support system and the parole board released me, um, at my six month mark. But really I had filed a habeas corpus was winning, um, and they released me. So um, I've been in and out, um, and I've been doing a lot of studying, and I've gotten really motivated to be a part of this change, and that's why I'm here mm-hmm. today. Mm-hmm. Great, absolutely. And you had spoke with me on the other day because it's, it appears that what is, is spiking now with um, offenders that are being released is they're creating their own podcasts. They're going on the airways. They're making their voices heard in the areas of the pain, what they have uh, been through, because I'm pretty sure, you know, most of the individuals that I speak with, they don't um, state anything about, well, I didn't do it or, or, or I shouldn't have been there. People are angry and outraged as to how the law is uh, coming up with so much time and how they're misconstruing uh, the sentencing guidelines to um, extend the time for offenders. So, um, you know, um, my hat is off to you on that as well um, in that area. So our next guest is going to be Laura Wetzel, and so we want you to be able to um, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you um, so we can um, kind of uh, move around to the panel a little bit. Um, And I do apologize for... um, one of the guests not being here because she's on vacation. So we'll see her next week, hopefully sometime. So anyway, so tell us a little bit about you, um, Laura, uh, briefly as to how you got started um, in the um, the system um, and take us from there. Yes. Thank you for having me. My name is uh, Laura Wetzel and I'm a 49 year old African American. I was adopted when I was um, 18 months by a Caucasian family in Pennsylvania. Uh, My upbringing was difficult. Um, They adopted another uh, black child who was biracial. Um, I only went to school till about third grade. Uh, They told my parents they didn't want coloreds in school. So I kind of stayed home. 
Sometimes I go to work with my father. Sometimes I go to work with one of my brothers who drove truck. I was a very mm -hmm. difficult um, child to raise. I was um, physically abused, sexually abused by my father and one of my brothers. Um, a very angry child. Um, I didn't see my first black person until I was 11. Went home and told my mom I saw somebody who looked like my arm. Um, they ended up locking me up in institutions. Um, when I turned 18, the institution found my biological family. They flew me on a plane to Colorado. Um, after 18 years, uh, it didn't really work out. I stayed with my biological family for a couple months, um, went back and forth kind of to Pennsylvania, Colorado, um, just kind of been drinking and drugging my whole life. Um, had some kids, uh, got married, ended up uh, with my husband. I wrote a note while he ran into a bank. No weapon, but in the note, it, um, I wrote that he had a gun. So they gave him seven years. Um, I got eight months. Um, I came home. I was out for about a year. Um, social service waited for me to come home to give me back my kids. I was literally a week away from getting back my kids, mm -hmm. and they had cut off my benefits. I had never really worked. I didn't know what I was going to do. I kind of just gave up, and I decided that I was going to write my own note, and I just ran in the bank and robbed, robbed the bank. Um, they ended up giving me, I'm, I'm coming out of the 10th circuit in Kansas, and they ended up giving me career criminal. Um, at my sentencing, the judge asked me what my state prison ID number was. I told him I never went to state prison. The judge said, sure you did. And I said, no, I didn't. My attorney looked at me and said, you've been to state prison? And I said, no, sir. So the judge said, oh, well, never mind. Uh, what it was, was I had a state case, but it was under a year, so I did it at the county jail, mm -hmm. and um, they counted that as a career criminal. They gave me 14 years. I did every single day but 28 days, because by law, they had to let me out to come out to a halfway house. While incarcerated, oof, I went to every inside fence but Dublin, California. My bid was not easy at all. I was what you, what the officers and the administration wanted to call a convict. Um, it just kind of started out real simple. Um, walking down the hall, not doing anything. The officers just wanted to start cussing me out. So, and I respect authority. What I didn't respect was them cussing me out for not doing anything. So I just kind of started cussing right back. That quickly um, got me tagged as a difficult person, a difficult inmate. I started doing excessive amounts of confinement, special housing. When they first started putting me in special confinement, they had a lot of roaches, ants. They would put you in the shoe with uh, other people's blood, vomit, feces, um, mm -hmm. And as a punishment, the, the showers were outside of the rooms. You were on camera. The male guards okay. could see you. Um, okay, Laura, so, Laura, hold on, hold on for a second. We, we're we're going we're gonna to just hold it for one minute, okay? Hold that thought because we're going to come back to what you're relaying over to um, the audience, and then we're going to let – uh, the attorney be able to help uh, both of you as well as well as the other listeners that are listening okay so we're going to come right okay. back to that put a pin in it for me okay so Alan okay. <clears throat> share with us a little bit we have for the last few weeks we have talked about criminal law we have talked about criminal justice and so um, it was a statement that Stephen had made as in regards to his public uh, defender did not want it to um, be able to help him because of his his prior convictions and so to the audience how does the judge reappoint someone that would want to be able to handle a case if the public defender declines it Okay, Diane. Well, first of all, I'm really sorry to hear about Stephen's uh, um, 
uh, example. I mean, it's a terrible, terrible situation what he went through, um, and my heart goes out to him. Uh, first of all, I just want to, I just want to highlight one thing for your listeners about Stephen's situation, okay? And mm-hmm. I'm sure Stephen understands what I'm talking about. Um, there's something in the United States called the trial tax, okay? So everyone needs to know about that. And when I'm, I'm going to explain this to you so everyone knows. Under the Constitution, everyone is presumed innocent until proven guilty. We all know that, right? That's a constitutional right. Mm-hmm. And you have a right to a trial by your peers, and you have a right to confront the witnesses and the evidence against you. That's your constitutional right. Unfortunately, in our criminal justice system in the United States, 99.9% of cases are plea bargained out. So the few people who, who lack to, to, to ask for their constitutional right to have a jury trial, to have the state prove its case, if you are convicted after that trial, universally, the judge is going to hit you with a sentence much greater than you would have received in a plea bargain for the same exact facts. Mm-hmm. That's unique to the United States. A lot of other countries, right, if you if you take your case to trial, you get the same sentence as you would in a plea bargain. So a lot of people who take their case to trial and, and are convicted wind up getting a much greater sentence. Now, going back to his particular situation, I'm not sure of the exact circumstances of his case, but ordinarily, you know, a judge who, if there's an issue with the public defender, the judge should appoint... At the very least, a standby counsel. That's what that's what judge would ordinarily do. Would appoint a standby counsel to advise him and give him representation, especially in a serious felony case where he's exposed to that type of length of time of incarceration. Um, who will be ready to step in and take over the role of representing him if he if he got in over his head. The reality is, is anybody who's representing themselves as a pro se litigant in a serious um, a felony case of exposed to, exposure to 16 years in jail should not be representing themselves. It's just it's just too difficult to represent yourself, to cross-examine witnesses, and to make decisions about whether or not you're going to testify on your own defense or not, and analyze all the cases, especially if you don't have legal training and experience. It's it, you're basically it's a very difficult situation. Uh, to give you the ex- analogy, I always like to use: if you needed to have a heart transplant, right? You wouldn't pick up a book, you know, like how to do heart transplant 101, right? And then just buy a scalpel and start trying to do a heart transplant in your house, right? Because you want to go to somebody who does this every week and and who has a lot of experience doing it and you let them do it. I mean, yes, you have the right to be your own lawyer, right? But you probably don't have a lot of mastery on the rules of evidence. You don't have a lot of mastery on how to work the courtroom, right? And one thing just, Mm -hmm. just to note, for your listeners is usually when you see lawyers like Michael Avenatti, who I'm not a big fan of the, the, the guy who had the little scam with stormy Daniels and tried to extort Nike. Um, Mm -hmm. when he got arrested for his various crimes, what did he do? He went out and hired a lawyer right away. He's a lawyer himself. He didn't represent himself. So, you know, I, I feel sorry for Steven that his public defender threw him under the bus. But as you've seen in our show in the last couple of weeks with your show, that uh, <laughs> a theme is, is that public defenders sometimes don't have their clients' interests uh, first and foremost, and that there's not a lot of feedback loop to give a bad review to your public defender. They really don't care. They get paid the same. Mm-hmm. They get they most of the time they hang out with the state's attorney. They get paid by the by the same people that pay the state's attorney. They park in the same parking lot as the state's attorney. So almost I feel like they're in cahoots with the state's attorney. And they want to rock the boat, you know, and create conflict over there if they have to work for twenty or thirty years with the same people. So um, sometimes some of them, you know, really they're almost working for the state. That's my perception. Mhm, mhm. Absolutely. So, Stephen, we're going to go back to uh, back to you a little bit. And so, um, after that step that you had went through, as far as you being rejected um, in those terms, so what was the next step that you uh, took, or what was the next step was given to you as to making sure that you received a a fair uh, trial? And do you feel that your trial was uh, represented? Uh, uh, appropriately as it should have been. Okay, so um, uh, Alan is correct. So what had happened was um, 
I had went in and I had explained to the judge what my public defender had told me, which was that she believed that I was guilty, that I was letting the girl, um, that I was going to, you know, let her take the fall, which I wasn't because she never even received a charge. So um, I, I went in and explained this to the judge and asked for what in Colorado was called alternative defense counsel, which would have been an, a, an attorney – uh, a private attorney that would have stepped in and represented me. She refused to give me that, so I therefore then asked for um, uh, I asked for legal aid and a private investigator. She couldn't give me legal aid, so she gave me advisory counsel, which is exactly what Alan explained. And I got a great lawyer named Keith Pope, who helped me tremendously. He would come in um, for a couple weeks prior to trial, and he prepped me. He explained what leading questions were, open questions, um, what uh, you know, what we were gonna, just what exactly was gonna be happening at the trial. I'm gonna mm-hmm. be honest, I did great. You know, um, I, you know, there was a handgun that had been found in the car. Um, it had minimal DNA on it, 11.77 uh, picograms. Um, and the test kit had said that it needed 23 picograms for an accurate test. The judge wouldn't throw it out. Um, I showed the jury uh, exactly um, how inaccurate DNA was, uh, DNA transfer. Um, uh, I got the girl on the stand who was in possession of the drugs, who was in possession of the vehicle. Um, I got the officers to explain how they let me leave before they searched the vehicle. So when we got pulled over, they uh, asked me to step out. I said, I'm a passenger in a non felony stop. I have a right to not be harassed or molested. I want to leave right now. Um, it took a minute, but they allowed me to leave. Um, they left the girl alone mm. and unattended for about five minutes. Um, the drug dogs alerted to her purse, found nothing, and then found the makeup case in my seat where I had been removed from the vehicle. And the officers testified that it wasn't in the seat before I got out. Um, you know, it was a, it was a, you know, it, it was just a really, it, it was a really bad case. They had no mm-hmm. evidence. Um, <clears throat> my sentencing range was eight to 48 years. Um, I got lucky. The judge said that I had did such a tremendous job at, at trial that she'd seen how intelligent I was and she couldn't feel good about giving me a 48 year sentence. So she gave me twice the minimum, which was 16 years. I went back for reconsideration after attending college courses, drug and alcohol classes. Um, I got three years off, turning it into a 13-year sentence, and I was paroled my first shot after about almost seven years. Okay. But, okay. again, I sat in prison for seven years for a bag of dope that wasn't mine. And like you said a, a little bit ago, you know, I was in the wrong spot. I was with people, you know, I was using but to give me a 16-year prison sentence for a bag of drugs and a woman's makeup case, it was just, you know what I mean? I, I went in extremely bitter. Um, I filed my appeals. Uh, I had a lawyer do that, of course, because <laughs> there was, I mean, they, they offered me a really good lawyer. I took them. Um, I won on three counts of my appeal, but they said it was not enough to, I had eight issues. Three of the issues the appellate court agreed on, but said it was not enough to overturn the conviction which I never understood mm. but okay. um, yeah so that's what I went through with that okay 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 so um, uh, Laura, Laura um, we had uh, talked about a lot of things when you were sharing your story uh, with me on the other day and you also had shared to the fact of um, some some very excruciating things that you had to undergo through some of the uh, prison systems where you were transferred to and from through the 14 years that you were uh, um, incarcerated. Um, And so I wanted to just, uh, for you to kind of go through briefly a little bit about as far as the tactics that they used on you and as to why, because we we don't want the listeners to say, well, oh, they did that to her for no reason at all, just like you shared in the beginning, you know, that it was just something that aggressive move that they made towards you, and you made another aggressive move back towards them. So um, some of the things that you had shared with me, uh, uh, you know, was very – 
uh, degrading, and so we want to, uh, I guess, talk about that, and we want you to share with us about the bombing of how they did that, and we're going to discuss that as to what rights that an offender has that if an institution comes in and bombs them with highly equipped uh, uh, um, chemicals and they are, are perhaps maybe um, um, asthmatic or they have a respiratory um, issue as to that or how does that work? So just tell us a little bit because we want to make sure we get all the way around to the panel and then I'll come back mm-hmm. to you and I'll ask more questions, okay? Well, actually, I have a, um, a CPAP machine that I sleep with. Um, I have um, uh, in, three inhalers. I have an oxygen problem. I have a heart problem. I have two pancreatic masses, a splenic artery aneurysm that I got um, when the officers kicked me in my side with the steel-toed boots uh, while I was housed at FMC Carswell. Um, In 2017, they transferred me again to um, SCI Tallahassee, Florida. And I was literally sitting in the shoe, a special housing. They kept transferring me. And I'd go from the bus right to confinement because I had what was called a picture posted file. So what that meant was my jacket would get to the prisons before I physically would get there. So officers, staff would look at my profile first. So when I would get there, they would treat me bad based on this picture posted file uh, saying that I was assaulted to staff. So they literally would take me from the bus to the shoe. So I'm sitting in confinement on my desk writing a letter. Literally, that's all I'm doing. And the shoe cells are very, very small. And they opened up my trap door, and they literally threw a flash bomb through a gas grenade, a flash bomb, and a gas grenade. Then they opened up the door, rushed rushed in there, all the men in the tactical gear, grabbed me off the desk and threw me on the floor, put on the ambulatory restraints, uh, the belly chain, the cuffs on my ankle, and then the shackles on my feet. And then this is all filmed on camera. And since I've been home, they refuse to give me the videos. Um, But I do have the medical records about the excessive force, the examination. I had an eight by eight cut on my uh, right leg, a cut on my neck. Um, And then of course they have to do the blood pressure checks, the nurse checks. They're supposed to come in every two hours, check your restraints. Um, But I had a medical duty slip because of all my medical conditions that I'm not allowed to have gases, I'm not allowed to have sprays, things of that nature. Okay, so they take you out, they strip you down now on camera in front of all these men, and then they put you back in another jumpsuit because they have to check your body for injuries. Okay, Mm -hmm. so they put me back in a cell, in another cell. Now, mind you, I'm laying there now flat on my back, Um, I'm covered up with the blanket. They're supposed to come in every two hours, check your restraints. They never came to feed me lunch, give me medication, nothing. So about four or five hours went by. The nurse keys the door with the two guards. I actually have one of my, my wrist restraints off, just one, and I'm still attached to the belly chain, the other cuff, the shackles, never moved out of the bed, never nothing. They um, walk back out of the room, and like 30, 35 minutes pass. Next thing you know, they open up the trap door again and did the whole routine all over. Flash bomb, grenades, all of that. I never moved. I'm not a threat to anybody. They did it all over again. About a week later, um, the people who flash bombed me, the guards, the male guards, started coming into the shoe and saying, we're sorry, Wetzel. We don't know why we were ordered to do that. We didn't know you had all the medical issues. Um, The SIS lieutenant told all these other staff, we have mad respect for Wetzel. 
she took that. Most of the men won't even took that. You know, I mean, they thought it was funny. They thought it was a joke. I ended up having like a blood clot, the nurse said, on my right leg. They wouldn't see me for it. Um, they wouldn't take me to medical, just nothing. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, another time when I was at Carswell, they picked me up, used my head as a battering ram up against the metal door. My head was split open. Uh, blood was coming out of it. I had cuts everywhere. Um, mm. You know, like I shared with you about the overdose, they mm -hmm. gave me 14 bottles of medicine I wasn't supposed to have. I died at the prison, died uh, five times on the way to the hospital. Uh, they incubated me, traced me, put me on life support, called my family, but never once told my family per policy that they could come and see me or told my family how I got the medicine or why I was on life support. Then they put it in the medical record that said the decision was made to pull the plug because of the cost. The Bureau of Prisons didn't want to pay for the life support. So when they pulled the plug, and this is all medical records that I have here with me, um, they pulled the plug. The doctor at the John Peter Smith Hospital said it was against the law to pull my life support plug without an advanced directive. So he said, I don't care about your prison policy. I'm plugging her back in. So he plugged me back in. When I got back okay. to the institution, I actually ordered my medical records, and that page was in there saying that they pulled the life uh, support because of the cost. When the institution mm -hmm. found out I had that medical record, they confiscated it from me, and I never saw it again. Okay, um, okay. so so we're going to stop right there. Uh, we're going to stop right there, Laura, and then we're going to let the attorney come in, and we're going to let him address some of your concerns. I, I hate to keep cutting you off like that, but we want to make sure because you have went to, you have reached out to um, the former president, Barack Obama, of the White House, of all of these things that have happened to you, and also you have went to some senators, and you have been um we detoured in another way, which we're going to try to talk. We're going to try to get all of that in the broadcast too, if we can. But I want um, um, Alan to be able to share with um, all of us as to if 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 an offender comes in and it's already known that they have certain issues, certain health issues, respiratory issues, or they they can't be around heat and what have you, but they still use the excessive force. To be able to, and which, you know, I, I feel that, I mean, I do know that institutions can use whatever type of restraint they need to do to be able to subdue someone. But I'm saying if the person already has medical problems and the institution already knows about it, because this case here with Laura um, Allen, she is going, she has reached out to other individuals that are in politics and they have turned her down and have said some very um, crucial things to her, like, you know, what do you think I'm going to do? Or how do you think I'm going to handle something like this? And so um, we just want, you know, and, and, and we're not here to pat up anybody. We just want the facts from the law. Can they, can they do that? Can they use excessive force even if they were aware that she had uh, pr problems with the respiratory uh, breathing? Well, Dan, um, I'm really, uh, I'm really dist distressed, upset, and shocked to hear uh, this 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 lady's story. Um, nobody should have to go through this. Um, you know, let me let me point out something that um, that that should be apparent to everybody. Um, you know, cell phones have empowered citizens to hold police accountable. Right mm -hmm. now, now. You know, I, I've made it clear on your show on past occasions that, that I, I personally believe that a large number of large proportion of the police department, you know, for the most part, are are, are good people trying to do their job. But mm -hmm. there are a lot of bad actors. There's a good number of bad bad apples out there that are doing really horrible things. And luckily, through the use of cell phones, right? Mm -hmm. Lately, in the last few years, we've seen. You know, I think it all started with Rodney King. Someone had actually a video camcorder, and they video they camcorded these police officers beating Rodney King with uh, with batons. 
um, that was like one of the first cases of <coughs> video, you know, exposing police brutality. Um, mm-hmm. And since then, it's accelerated, you know, because everyone has a, a powerful video machine in their pocket, right? So, so police mm-hmm. are really, you know, have to be careful about what they're doing now, and they're required to, to, to have body cams on them. So we have a lot of movement in the direction of the police department. But what about the corrections officers in the jails, right? Okay. What about those folks, right? Mm-hmm. So basically, you know, and especially in the private prisons, right, which is a huge problem. Uh, if you look at the statistics, the private prisons, we have a huge private prison industry in the United States. The private prison, the rate of violence and injuries to prisoners and death to prisoners is much higher than in, in publicly run prisons. They're just mm-hmm. really dangerous places for inmates to be. Um, the uh, the fact is is how where's the accountability? Because a prisoner in the in a facility doesn't have a cell phone available to record or to document what's going on. So usually it's like the the prisoner's word against the the guard. So the guard can just lie. So it be, it becomes really difficult. So. What I've seen in, in my in my practice uh, has been the, the most effective recourse for a prisoner who suffered a physical injury while incarcerated um, has been to contact a civil rights attorney to file a, a civil lawsuit against the state and and the, the actual guard to for for personal injuries and civil rights violations and to seek monetary mm-hmm. compensation. That's that's the best way to to get accountability that I've seen. Now, yes, you can contact your 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 elected officials, um, and as you see with our elected officials, they kind of like work on, on a knee jerk reaction. You know, right now um, there's a lot of activity with the Black Lives Matter. You have mm-hmm. now you have them they're, they're taking a lot of response. Now all of a sudden they want to abolish Christopher Columbus Day. They want to do a lot of things. <laughs> they're trying to you know they're trying to make everyone happy because they see everyone's upset and they, and, and there's a lot of activity going on. But unfortunately there's not a lot of resonance or or movement with politicians if you call them up about a prisoner getting beat up in jail. And in the general population right now there's not a lot of sympathy for inmates because although myself i understand that inmates a a lot of them are wrongfully accused should not be in jail in the first place b many of them as some of the 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 fellow panelists today um are people with drug problems who who i believe sincerely should be in drug treatment instead of a prison in the first place that society is not helping them by putting them into or helping society by putting a drug offender into a prison, they should put them into a drug treatment program, which would be much more effective use of resources. Mm-hmm. And 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 see finally, by allowing a prison to brutalize a human being, you know, and to um, harm them in this way. Luckily, our fellow panelists today are very enlightened people who seem to have a very good perspective about what they've been through and are here sharing their voice. How many? Inmates have been through such a deplorable and horrible experience who turn very bitter and uh, come out of that and just want to go out and commit more crimes because they're just angry. So, so, so I think the prison system needs to be reformed, and I'm hoping that the Black Lives Matter uh, movement will, will direct some of its attention towards um, the situation in prison. Because, um, as I've said many times, um, black uh, uh, and minorities are disproportionately incarcerated. The, the per capita rate of incarceration of Afro-Americans in, in our prison system is 2,000 out of, out of 100,000. And for white mm-hmm. people, it's around 50. There's something mm-hmm. wrong with that. Um, mm-hmm. I don't believe for a minute that, that Afro-American people are any more violent or dangerous or, 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 or committing any more crimes than white people or any other people. I, mm-hmm. I just think that the system as a systemic bias is, un, is, is the police are discriminating against them or targeting them. The system is disproportionately giving them uh, unfair representation and, and a harsh sentence. And it's just, a, it's a, it really shocks the conscience. And hopefully, you know, all of this 
political activity can be directed towards that. Um, hopefully, I would suggest to your to the fellow listeners, you know, I mean, and to also to to fellow panelists, um, one way of getting things done today is by organizing groups. We can see the Black Lives Matter group is really powerful. You know, perhaps mm-hmm. the the panelists should get involved with the Black Lives Matter and see if they can rotate this into their list of of um, issues that they want to uh, expand upon and also get involved with Facebook groups. They're very easy to get involved with. When you're speaking with one voice and you're reaching out to a politician and saying, listen, I've been aggrieved, I have a problem, it's very difficult to get a politician's attention. When you, when you show up with three or 400 people outside of the Capitol and have a giant protest and there's people with signs and there are people screaming and outraged, that's when you're going to get their attention. Oh, wow. That makes a whole lot of sense. That makes a whole lot of sense. So just it's it's just a waste of time to go in there and try to file a, a – a, to try to go in and talk to a senator, try to go in and perhaps maybe talk to a district attorney. That's, and that's what – it appears that that's the only way that um, – that they are going to listen. It's just like it's one person that's coming in. I don't have time to pay any attention to this, even though they may see the out justice, the injustice. I'm sorry, even with the uh, with the um, evidence that um, Laura may have, because you know she was uh, explaining to me yesterday, and she is explaining to the um, guest as well on the show today that um, she has a lot of uh, uh, information, a lot of uh, proof, and what have you. I'm just kind of confused confused as to how the institutions are um, getting away with all of that, you know, as of today, because like when I used to work back in the federal um, institution, this was from 2000 to back to 2008, of course, we wouldn't think about anything like that. If we would do something to those offenders or to those inmates, the warden would fire us right there on the spot. And so today it seems like the justice system is broken as to um, in some areas, like the, 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 the big fiasco that's going on in San Quentin, you know, even with, uh, with, the, with the inmates there and things. It is so much that continues to go on, especially in California, about these, these, these outrage laws. These, and I think that's where the three strikes your outlaw came from, too. And so it's just ridiculous. Oh, it's totally ridiculous. So we're going to go to, uh, we're going to go back to Laura. We're going to come to you in a little bit, Stephen. But Laura, we're going to come back to you. And so now when she refers to the shoe, that's talking about segregation. So segregation, some people call it the hole. Some people call it the black hole. Some people call it segregation. And um, she's calling it the shoe because that's the way they uh, refer to as to the um, institutions that she uh, was housed at. So in in regards to uh, what Alan had just um, had just mentioned, he gave you the feedback. It's, it's probably not enough for you just to go in there, just one person at a time. And even though I know that you told me that when you were concert, you were incarcerated back at the time when uh, the former president Barack Obama was in office and what have you, sometimes it may help us a little bit better if if things are done basically like in a group versus just you going to um, just one person and perhaps. Um, um, you know, sharing um, your story there. So we want to go just a little bit more further into your story, and we want you to talk about um, as well as um, how this kind of perhaps maybe affected you in a mental type of way um, as to how these physicians were trying to diagnose you um, as to all of the trauma that you had went through down through the years. Oh, well, let me tell you, I was I already had diagnosis before I went to prison. Okay. But being in confinement in a little room by yourself, um, the first year I did in the shoe, I did it with a house alone sticker and a lieutenant hold. So they only took me outside five times in a year. They wouldn't let me have my oxygen machine. Uh, so imagine sitting in a little room with no book, nobody to talk to, not going outside. Um, I'm already light-skinned, so I had bruises 
all over my body. I had no vitamin D in my system. Uh, region had to approve for a 50,000 50, unit pill of a vitamin D for me to take. Um, it, it messes with you. It messes with your mind. So mm -hmm. the only thing that would work for me was to talk to Jesus. So the guards would mess guards. with me because I'd be in the, the shoe cell talking to Jesus. Um, it was horrible. I mean, I'd be in there talking to Jesus. Roaches are crawling on you. Uh, they get caught in your hair. They won't let you have a comb. You know, you're African-American. They won't let you have a haircut. So they make you shave your hair all off. Um, it was just horrible. I mean, I was writing my judge, telling him that my physician assistant jumped up and down on my stomach and busted my bladder until another officer had to pull him off of me. Um, in 2014, they tried to release me from prison. They filed a motion saying that I was incorrectly sentenced. But because I wrote them letters to the judge um, complaining about the abuse and what was being done uh, to me, the judge counted them as 2255s, even though they were just letters and not even in motion form. Uh, the second time, I did 14 months straight in the shoe, being transferred all around the bureau. So in Washington, in central office, I got red flagged in the computer. So um, the Office of Inspector General, they transferred me back to Carswell, and they came to see me and tape recorded me for about three and a half hours. And um, they said I got red flagged because they're transferring me all over the Bureau of Prisons, and I'm going from the bus right to the shoe. And Obama had made it to where you just couldn't go to the shoe. And they kept transferring me and putting me right into the shoe. So they wanted to know why. So they lied to the prison. They didn't call the prison and say, hey, we're coming. And they got in there and they said, hey. And now this is OIG who regulates the prison, helps regulate it, and said, hey, we want to know why you keep going to the shoe. And I told them I got this picture posted file on me, and they keep transferring me everywhere. So I did the majority of my time in confinement in the SHU. Um, another time they put me in ambulatory restraints, 38 hours on a concrete slab naked uh, for no reason. They started just putting me in there. If I would have a conflict with an officer because they just, they bully you, they would say, oh, you know what, take her to special housing. Take, take your clothes off her. I mean, it wasn't about being suicidal. It wasn't any of that. They just started using it as a punishment. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it's just so crazy, the things that they did to me. Um, they kicked me out of food service for seven weeks without a memo. I had no food. They locked my account for six years across the board, which is illegal. I couldn't buy stamps. I couldn't use the phone. I couldn't do anything. So I used to use my counselor's phone to call home. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I could just go on and on. Okay. Um, okay. So, so we're going to let Alan interject in here real quick because, um, Alan, we have to – um, have talked about uh, previously on the show about, you know, um, some of the things that uh, uh, an offender that we were discussing, Curtis Watson, and um, in regards to that. And so um, and some of the things that she is explaining to the audience, that some of the things that he is now going through as well at the maximum security in Nashville. So how far in your terms or the experience that you have had out of 30 years of being a uh, criminal defense attorney, what is punitive? You know, we hear about punitive damages when we go to court when, it, when it's civil. But how can, what is it, what, well, I'm not going to ask how can. They, they have the right if the, the law is passed. But what does punitive damages or what does punitive punishment, that's the word I'm looking for, punitive punishment mean in the criminal justice system? Well, um, Dan, I, I, I just want to point out um, that, you know, again, we have this, this tremendous light that's being shined on 
the problems with the quote unquote system right now, right? Mm-hmm. With with mm-hmm. all these young people that are out on the street, and and it, and you know what? It's beautiful to me. You know, I, I don't necessarily agree with everything that they're saying. You know, personally, you know myself, I don't agree necessarily with defunding the, all the police. Uh, mm-hmm. Who's going to be mm-hmm. out there to help you if you have a problem? But but be right. that as it may, I think it's great that we see people of all races and colors, all races and colors, young people join together. To, to help change these problems to me that's mm-hmm. beautiful right because it's mm-hmm. no longer a black and white issue for the young people they're tired of this they're tired the young people are tired they see what's going on right you don't see out there just black folk or, or Latino folk you see white mm-hmm. kids out there with them they're just as mm-hmm. angry right they're what? outraged <laughs> and, and, and I see this as a triangle the system is a triangle it's a three part problem okay so the three parts are number one the police Treat people of color and sometimes people of uh, you know regular folk mm-hmm. unfairly. They use their badge, and and you know what? It might be not necessarily they're putting your knee on, on your their knee on your neck, but just the way they talk to you and the way they treat you is rude, and they're using their power and they're making you feel uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's the first mm-hmm. step. The second step is once they're arresting you, and sometimes they're arresting you falsely. When you get to court, right. You're not being adjudicated properly, and and you're and you're being treated. Your rights are not being respected. And you're not getting a fair adjudication, and sometimes you're being railroaded into something you didn't do, and and you're getting an unfair treatment in court. So that's the second part that needs to be addressed. And the third part, which unfortunately, and that's the reason why I'm mentioning this three parts of the problem, the triangle of the problem of criminal justice, which mm-hmm. is a, which is a, a big problem in our in our country, is the prison state. Right. That's the part where right now is not getting a lot of play with this movement. Right. They're addressing most of it towards the police problem, which is, to me, the smallest part of the problem. Because, as you see, if you're a person that's getting into the criminal justice system, your your interaction with the police is very short. Right. It lasts for Mm -hmm. a few hours. Then you're going to be spending perhaps decades of your time locked in a prison. Right. Isolated from society, sometimes in a shoe or, or, or in lockdown, unable to communicate with anybody. It, you know what? In these prisons, for, sometimes for almost no reason at all, they'll throw you in isolation where you cannot communicate with anyone, sometimes even your lawyers. For instance, mm-hmm. I'll, tell, I'll share with you a story. I had a client of mine who was doing 25 years, and um, his cellmate had uh, like his, one of these little knives in the cell and they said to my client, we want you to rat them out, you know, which in the prison is basically very dangerous to do is to rat somebody out. It's, it's, it's basically you, you're known as a rat. It's very dangerous for your safety. So he just said, listen, I, I don't want to rat them out. I don't want to get involved. You know, it's his, it's, it's, it's not mine. I have nothing to do with it. I don't want to rat anyone out. Right. They mm-hmm, said, listen, mm-hmm. either you rat them out or you're going into, you're going into the shoe. We're going to put you in there for a year. And then mm-hmm. all of a sudden I couldn't hear from this guy. I didn't hear from him for a year. I had to go there to the prison myself to find out what was going on with him. And there was very little I could do. They just put him in there for, for almost no reason. He wasn't able to, to have any visitation. He was unable to have any rights. And, you know, there was, there was no ability to appeal this decision. There was no ability to um, get any review. It's basically depriving him of his rights, whatever little rights he has as a prisoner, for almost no reason and, and and who's to say whether a year or a week or six months is appropriate? And there's a lot of brutality going on as you, as your panelist today is expressing. I, I'm crying as I'm listening to this woman um, uh, expressing years of abuse and torture that we're funding as taxpayers, that we're paying for this, that this is representing our nation, that this is happening in the United States of America to this poor woman, that she's going through this trauma at, at our hands, right? by a bunch of Mm -hmm. sadistic nuts that are being paid for by us that are doing this to her for no reason. She didn't do anything. Um, We need what we need, Diane, the solution to this problem is the same individuals that are out there on the street who are, who are outraged about the police officers who, who who are killing a few individuals every year. Mm -hmm. We need to have those individuals turn and be just as outraged and be out in front of prisons 
and, and, uh, and angry because so many of our black and brown brothers and sisters are locked up in prisons all across America unfairly and they're being brutalized in the prisons and treated in deplorable conditions and we need to have these young people outside the prisons and blocking the gates of the prisons when the guards have to come in and out and, and, and saying that we need to set these people free and we need to stop the injustice in these prisons. That, that's the answer. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. So, Stephen, um, we're going we're gonna to come back to you real quick. And so what would you, in your terms, what would you think would be a real good, um, a real good strategy to be able to, to um, change what's going on on the inside in your state? We know different states have different um, policies. They have different laws. You know, I was, I was told that the other day that there are different laws that go on in different states, so it's different. So in your state, what would you like to see changed? Okay, I'm glad you asked that because that's what I really wanted to get to today with prison reform. So um, I've been through a lot of the similar stuff that uh, Laura has been through. I did almost four years in solitary confinement. I did years in the high security side of the prison. I did time in Florence, uh, United States Penitentiary. Um, I've seen exactly what she's talking about. Um, and what I feel is that these, this system, the whole entire system, but Colorado mostly, um, is what I know about, is warehousing offenders. And by warehousing, yeah. I mean uh, I spoke about taking some college courses and some classes. I had to fight to get that. I was one of the few that got to take them. Um, uh, everybody goes in these, into these prisons and they sit in their housing units. They get a little bit of rec time. They, um, they, you know, they get some phone time. Uh, they play cards. They do all that. But we're sitting in these prisons doing nothing with all this time that they have given us. Um, and what I would like to see is something along the lines of the European model, Norway, where people go into prison. It's not a punishment per se. It is, of course, our freedom is taken or their freedom is taken. But when they go in there, these guys and girls are educated in, in the European prison model. They go mm-hmm. in, they're educated, um, career training. Um, it, it, it's almost like a job for in some of these prisons. It, the prison cells aren't hard, uh, bare, um, just a bunk with nothing on the walls. Um, they're given uh, a, a full... Uh, play on, uh, uh, on the table all day long of going to class, educating themselves, learning, and the recidivism rate in Norway is 20% versus Colorado, which is 50%. So one out of every two offenders in Colorado is going back to prison upon release, you know, within, within six months about. Um, in, in Europe, it's 20%. So the thing is, is in Colorado, these uh, – Officers go through two weeks of training. In Europe, they go through two years. In Norway, two years. They take two years of college before they're even allowed to become an, a, a prison guard per se, and then they're allowed. Then they're allowed to go in and work with guys and girls. And they go in, they train in, they do welding, they do uh, automotive, they do whatever they can. Then they help them find a job when they get out. Colorado, you got to fight for that. If Colorado would take the guys that want to learn, that want to become better, and that want to do something with their lives, put them all in one prison, turn it into almost a job corps, train them, Mm -hmm. educate them, and then release them as better people. That that is what Colorado needs to do. That's what the United States needs to do. All the money that they're spending is $50,000 a year to house an offender. You know, what would it cost to hire more teachers, slow down the prison intake, a nonviolent drug offender, property crime, things like that, and educate the guys so when they release, they they have something to look forward to. They have something to better themselves with. Nobody does that. They offer a college mm-hmm. course here, a college course there, and uh, that's the end of it. You know, like five people out of the whole prison are going to college. That's wrong. Mm-hmm. If they would go in there and do something with it, the the recidivism rate would drop tremendously. And in Colorado, Dean Williams keeps talking about normalization. I'm going to normalize the prisons. I'm going to make them more like Europe. But he says that, and he does nothing. Why doesn't he take one of these prisons, move all those problematic offenders to another prison, all the non-problematic offenders that want to learn, 
into that prison, start educating them, and then studying the, the, the rate of recidivism and seeing, seeing what works and what doesn't versus using mm-hmm. your $50,000 a year to warehouse a bunch of guys, most of them that don't even need to be there. Just like Alan's talking about, drug treatment. You know, instead of taking that 50000 bucks a year and sticking it into a prison, take that 50000 bucks, put it into a treatment program, and, 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 and teach us that there's something better. You know, that, that's what I would like mm-hmm. to do. Mm-hmm. And I have a whole mm-hmm. lot of thoughts on how to do it, but we really don't have the time <laughs> to get into it. Okay, that's okay. But so I'm going to turn it back over to Alan real quick and let him respond to that because sometimes when when individuals have initiatives set up, they will they will go in there and they will they will share the initiative, they will talk about the initiative, they will publish the initiative, but it never gets done because there sometimes there there is um um, um under table money that goes to individuals yes. in government uh, positions. So we're going to turn that over to Alan and let him elaborate on that a little bit. Well, Diane, um, the reality is, if you if you look at the numbers, right, about the United States, um, we're, we're a prison state, right? And what's going on is there's a lot of special interests and lobbying and and there's a lot of jobs at stake here in this prison in this prison state. I mean, if you think about it, we have more people locked down here in the United States than China and Russia combined. You know, wh- why is mm-hmm. that, right? That's because there's a lot of people making money, right? And there's a huge, huge private pr- prison industry now. So, you know, we're, uh, Steve is talking really rationally, right? It makes a lot of sense. I mean, sixty thousand dollars a year is the average cost to to incarcerate somebody. You know, I've said it many times on this show. That sixty thousand dollars a year, you could put somebody up in, in, in a small dorm, right, and send them to a a, a, a public uh, college and give them a degree, right? So mm-hmm. this is a tremendous waste of resources, right? Uh, when mm-hmm. you when you put somebody in prison, when they come out, there's there's actually uh, a population right now of seven hundred thousand newly released people that are out of prison in the United States. Now, if you come out of if you come out of prison with a felony record, right, and you're not trained, and you have a felony record, you just got out of prison, you know, what do you think your job prospects are? It's going to be very hard to find a decent, good job, right? You might be able to find mm-hmm. a job, but it's probably not going to be your dream job, right? So that's mm-hmm. like a huge problem. There's 700,000 people out there right now who, who have that hurt, the obstacle. You know, it's like a handicap to try to find a job. Um, it, it, this is a problem. This is a handicap for our entire society. And the problem is until people start to understand that, that we have a whole generation of youth who were destroying their future. We're not equipping them for success in their later years. We're actually harming them. And we're not solving their problem. To Stephen's point, if someone has a drug issue, right, putting them in a prison is not going to solve their drug problem, Right. A lot of mm-hmm. times drug problems come from genetic uh, predispositions towards, you know, uh, addictive personalities. Sometimes they come from stress factors, right? Stress and environmental issues. If you take someone who had a drug problem before they went to prison and you put them in prison, then they're, they're having additional stress, right? When they come out, they probably didn't really learn a lot of ways of dealing with their drug problem. Another issue that's really fascinating to me, you know, I, I, I haven't been in prison, but I've visited a lot of prisons and I've talked to a lot of my clients who are in prison. It seems to me that drugs are readily available inside the prison. Perhaps some of your other panelists will speak to this. And um, alarmingly, it seems that for people who are drug users, drugs are readily available in the prison. So very often yep. people who are drug addicts, you know, once they, once they go, go to prison, they're, they're continuing to do drugs, and um, basically it's not solving their drug problem. So I agree 100% with Stephen's uh, uh, comments, um, and, 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 and again, I reiterate my uh, dream, my, my premise that we need a systemic change in the um, prison system uh, as we've, uh, and we've have, we do have some areas of the country where they are making uh, these type of changes, for instance, in New York City, we have a very liberal mayor. I don't agree with all of his initiatives, 
But one of the things that he's doing is he's taking Rikers Island, which is a very famous prison, and he's mm-hmm. downsizing it, and he's making these these changes. You know, in New York State, we've gone away from a bail system, and they're trying they're trying. It, it's not working really well, but they're they're trying to like do away with bail on all cases. So that a lot of times we have people sitting in jail in Rikers Island who were not even convicted of a crime and sitting there for a year or two or three years waiting for their trial date and possibly for something that didn't even um, commit a crime just because mm-hmm. they couldn't afford a small bail. So in order mm-hmm. to have e- e- equity and equality in the criminal justice system, they did away with cash bond because some people just can't afford a cash bond. Why should a rich person who can afford a cash bond be out of liberty in their nice house and, and relaxing whereas a person who has no resources be stuck in jail waiting for their trial for a year or two and sitting in a jail just because they don't have any money what's the difference between the two of them just one doesn't have any money so so you know it makes a lot of sense to to look at the examination of doing away with cash bonds as particularly in low you know nonviolent offender drug cases so i really think that that this this show is is a great step Towards, towards, towards a dialogue, towards a, a movement, towards getting some of this, this, this great energy that these youths have out there in, the, in, in, in towards reform, towards changing the system. And one of the problems is all the people who are locked down in jail, and we should keep them in our prayers, but we should also do something active and speak with our voices, use our voices, and, and use our energy to, to advocate for them to try to do something to change the system and embarrass these politicians who are getting rich, who are enriching themselves. And most of these politicians are multimillionaires, and they live in million-dollar homes, and, and they have a lot of assets. And you have to ask yourself, how is somebody like a Nancy Pelosi or all these people who are in power, who've been in power for 30, sometimes 40 years, how would these people have millions and millions and millions of dollars? How did they get that if they're a civil servant and they're working in government and they make a, a meager salary? How did they amass millions and millions of dollars? <laughs> There's corruption. So, mm-hmm. so uh, yes. we, need to, we need to take the government back for the people because the government should be working for us. And when, when um, a huge proportion of our society is locked down in horrible prisons being treated like this, it should make every citizen upset because a lot of times, and I'll just say one more thought on this subject is, you know, our two panelists here today can probably attest to this more than anyone, is, you know, a lot of people out there say, you know what, I don't care about prisoners because they're just convicts, they're criminals, and you know what, I want those people locked up. But what people don't understand is, the average citizen doesn't understand is, you know what, one wrong turn in your life you know, one coincidence that happens to you and a policeman could frame you for a crime that you never committed, you might be totally innocent and you might be the next person sitting in jail yourself. And you might be, mm-hmm. you, 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 the person who's listening to this show who thinks, you know what, you don't have any problem with the law, you may find yourself one day sitting in the shoe and, and thinking back to when the time you were listening to this show and saying, wow, you know what, that guy Al... I, I should have listened to him because I didn't think that I could possibly go to jail until we get to that point where, where the average person realizes that police could plant evidence on them, police could frame them for a crime they didn't do, and they may wind up in a prison. They're not going to start thinking about prison reform because they just think it's criminals that wind up in prison and not them. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Absolutely. I agree with that. Uh, simply because of of the fact that the the, the the laws are so corruption today, they are so corrupted as to people are are you know uh, working any type of of, of way uh, as to uh, boost their you know their political career so that, you know well boost their persona up so you know I agree with you absolutely so we're gonna um, go back to Laura and so Laura we want you to be able to share with the audience as well as to your um, perception on how do you think that prisons can be able to make a difference now so take for instance like what take take for instance of what Alan has shared with all of us today and take for instance what you have went through as well as Stephen as well. How can you make a change? Because it's like he stated, and which I agree with him totally, 
just by uh, me. I can have all the documentation today. Documentation, they don't, people don't even care, not even lawmakers. They don't even care about what you have proof on the paper. Um, well, we talked about something on the show last week in regards to the case about Curtis Watson, where the district attorney is trying to twist the, um, even though he put something on paper, but he still went back to the media and said everybody needs to refer back to what the TBI agent went in there and testified against. Okay, but later on they go in there and send something else totally different and said that the DNA did not belong to Curtis Watson. So um, things can be twisted, even if we have things written down in black and white. So what perception do you have? Do you have anything that could be able to blow your case out of the rim, like he, he he gave some more resources to uh, the both of you all, and which is Black Lives Matter. Now, Black Lives Matter is just not for African American or the urban communities. They stand for civil rights, regardless if it's black, white, or Hispanic. So there's a lot of work that um, all of us could do. So in your mm-hmm. perception, what would you think would be the next move Taken from what Alan have shared with everybody on the on the show today, what would be the next move to charge to get you charged and energized? Because, like I told you, you have a case where it can actually your story, not the case, but your story can actually be heard by Dateline. Dateline is an investigation um, um, channel. It's an investigation uh, platform where they go into prisons. They just had um, something back here about a couple of weeks ago where two brothers were locked up, one for 20 years, the other one was for 27 years, and they were exonerated. So what is it that you could be able to bring to the table that could empower you to move forward with this? Yes, I saw that. Um, Well, first, I'd like to, I mean, 14 years I've saw a lot. I mean, hundreds of people who were incarcerated that did not need to be incarcerated, um, wrongly accused, I mean, ghost dope, I mean, just stupid things. Um, Mm -hmm. I think it should start with the sentencing guidelines. I mean, some of them in different states are just all across the board, don't make a lot of sense. Um, And then kickbacks, it seems like some states, some judges, some attorneys get kickbacks just for locking people up. Um, and I think it has to do also with accountability. These judges and these attorneys need to start being accountable for what they're doing with locking these young black men up and, uh, you know, just locking people up. Um, and then when you get into the prison system, like you said, there's nothing to do. In the federal system, Inmates are getting paid 12 cents an hour. So if you're somebody on a white collar crime and owes $12 million and you're getting paid 12 cents an hour, um, the government's never going to get their money back. Um, And there should be no medical centers. Um, There's a lot of changes that need to happen. Like, for example, the wardens are getting six figures. Um, A counselor one day told me, He was working overtime and asked me to go upstairs. He said, hey, Wetzel, um, I'm getting $44 an hour right now. I need you to go upstairs and get such and such for visitation. I said, well, hey, I'm making 12 cents, and y'all are taking uh, 50% of that. So, no, you go get her. You know, so (laughs) they're making a lot of money off of us and um, just to abuse us and, and things. And I think there needs to be a whole lot of changes. But for people coming out of the system, it would be nice if like every quarter or twice a year, if inmates could go to Congress, go to special special counsel and say, hey, look, I just came out of five years, 10 years, and this is what was going on. These are the changes that need to happen. If I think maybe if special counsel heard from inmates that did, you know, some time on the inside and said, okay, you know, and and brought to the table things that need to change or things that need to be different, maybe would make a difference. And if police officers out here have to wear body cams, well, maybe officers in there need to wear body cams since Mm -hmm. we can't have cell phones or since they are illegal. 
and drugs, oh, my God, every drug imaginable that they have out here in the free world, yeah, they have in there. And um, officers don't necessarily have to bring it in. There was drugs coming in through the mail. Um, I mean, yeah, officers do bring a lot in. I watched a lot of my peers get strung out and then have to go out there and get that um, methadone. I watched a lot of my peers die, mm-hmm. you know, for mm-hmm. drugs or medical mishaps. But there's a lot of changes. And like you said, we're warehouse. It's all about money. They don't care about us. There's no programs. Uh, there's nothing for us to do. If you want to change and you want to make a difference, it has to come from the inside. I mean, I would have the officers crying, male and female lieutenants, coming in apologizing to me and saying, hey, Wetzel, um, I can't take the abuse they're doing to you or your peers. I'm out of here. I'm leaving. I got a, I got family to feed. I got a conscience. I'm leaving this prison. You know, so you always knew which ones were the the, the good officers because they couldn't take it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've mm-hmm. got correspondence from the White House. Why is this inmate writing about all this abuse? Uh, you know, it's it's just sad. I made it out because I know a lot of my peers would come up to me even if they didn't speak English, and you know, thank me. And they would tell me, you have a voice, I don't, I'm scared. Or they won't want their Mm -hmm. property thrown away. You know, after I'd speak up or whatever, then the officers on the next shift would come in, raid your locker and throw everything away. You know, well, I didn't care about my property. But, um, yeah, Mm. there's a lot of things that need to change. And I didn't mind singling myself out there to help my peers. I made it out. A lot of my peers did not. Uh, So I don't mind being out here, being a voice to help them. But definitely, I think it should start in the courts. And I think it should be stopped there. Because a lot of people just do not need to be locked up. And I think Mm -hmm, it should start mm -hmm. with the guidelines. And they should stop them kickbacks. And then judges should be held accountable. Um, Like in my case, when that judge looked at me and said give me your state ID. Uh, and I said, I've never been to state prison. And he says, yes, you have. My attorney should have said, hey, she's never been to st- uh, state prison. Let's stop it right here until we can figure it out. But my my attorney didn't care because he wasn't getting paid, you know, by me. Oh. So that would have made a difference in my guideline. And I probably wouldn't have done 14 years. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, there's a lot of things okay. that need to be done. And... If I'm not mistaken, and the attorney here, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but whether you get paid or not, don't the public defenders have to fight for us like if they were getting paid by us? She's asking you a question, Alan. All right. Well, Diane, uh, that's a good point. The public defender is bound by the same ethical obligation as a regular attorney. Um, but what I've seen in, in practice, you know, regrettably, is that uh, the the um, first of all, the public defender is practically immune from any type of lawsuit. Um, and secondly, if you try to file a grievance complaint with the bar association against a public defender, I've never seen a, a public defender disciplined for not following the rules of professional conduct. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the biggest complaints against private lawyers is um, failure to communicate with your client, right? So so when you're representing a client, if your client has a question, whether they be in prison or outside the prison, when they contact you, you have to respond in a timely fashion. That's just, a, that's just one of the rules of professional responsibility for lawyers, right? Because when you have a lawyer that's representing you in the court, you, you need to be kept informed of what's going on in your case, right? Mm-hmm. right? We all agree upon that, right? You, you need yeah. to know what's going on. You, have, you, need to be, you need to be able to make an informed decision, right? So these public defenders, they're notorious, notorious public defenders for keeping their clients in the dark. When, when, the, when the client tries to reach their public defender from the prison and, and reach out to them, um, they don't get any communication whatsoever. And as we saw, we saw on your last show, which was really shocking, <laughs> which I couldn't believe, um, uh, the, the, your other our other panelists today are probably not aware of this. Maybe some of your listeners are. 
we, we had a case where uh, an individual who's facing a possible death sentence got a communication from the public defender that said, hey, listen, uh, we have some DNA evidence here that exonerates you, but uh, it's, it's interesting scientific information. But, you know, uh, despite that fact, your only choice is to plead guilty and take life without uh, parole. Uh, and, and that's what we're recommending to you. You don't have any other choices. And it didn't mention, you know what, by the way, you have a choice to take this case to trial and, and, and have the state prove the case guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, never even mentioned that in the letter. So, um, look, let me just say this. I've been doing this for 28 years as a private criminal lawyer, okay? And I just throw this point out for your listeners to think about, right? I charge money, okay? I'm not doing it for the money. I'm doing it because I want to help people solve their problems. But the reality is I do charge a fee, right? And a lot of times folks who hire me, they need to make a lot of sacrifices to pay me. A lot of people go on payment plans and they raise their fam- the money from family members and everything else. A lot of these people, they have public defenders and they get the money together and they hire me and they leave the public defenders. <laughs> what I'm saying to you is just imagine if you're running a restaurant or a supermarket in town, right? And then there was another restaurant or supermarket on the other side of town that had given away the same product for free. Like, hey, come on in. We're going to give it to you for free, right? And, you know, how could you run a business where you're charging for something where someone else is giving away the product for free, right? Well, mm-hmm. if the restaurant where they were giving away for free had, like, you know, rat hairs in the food and you had to wait online for 15 hours to get the, the food, and if you went to the counter, the person told you, you know what, go screw yourself, you know, uh, I hope you eat this food and get sick, then probably you wouldn't want to go back to that free restaurant, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of like dealing, how it's like dealing with a public defender, right? Yep. So, so when you get that kind of service and, and your life's at stake and your whole future is dangling in the balance and that's the person's attitude, then you say, you know what, is this person defending me or are they persecuting me? You know, and unfortunately, that's the experience that a lot of people have with public defenders. And that's the reason why they hire um, private criminal lawyers. And that's the reason why we're in business. And it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that way. Public defenders are some of the most experienced lawyers out there. They definitely have the skill set to adequately represent a client if they wanted to because they're in criminal court every day, right? They're being Mm -hmm. paid a lot of money to represent people, right? If they wanted to, Mm -hmm. they could do a good job, right? So you know what? I say as part of this movement that's going on right now for criminal justice reform, right? Why don't we have accountability and review for public defenders? No more public defenders for life, right? Why don't we have (laughs) like, like some kind of like a rating system for public defenders, right? The clients Mm -hmm. rating the the public (laughs) defenders, just like they rate criminal defense attorneys, right? Now look, if somebody goes online, they want to hire me. Right. Well, they're going to see my reviews. They're going to see what other clients are saying about me. And if I don't make my clients happy, I'm not going to be in business for long. So why don't the public defenders have, have a Google page, right? And that way the, the, the people who are assigned to them can see, you know what, this public defender doesn't have a lot of satisfied customers. And then person can go back to the judge and say, hey, listen, you know what, Your Honor, my public defender has like one star and everyone's angry. I don't want that public defender dealing with my life. I want a, I want a new public defender. And then the judges can finally be like, you know what, we need to fire this public defender because everyone's unhappy. Why can't we have accountability? Listen, if we're going to have accountability for police officers out there who are defending ourselves, right, and they're going to get fired if they're doing a bad job, why can't we have accountability for public defenders who are defending people's rights? If someone's life's in, at, at stake, if their liberty, if they're going to wind up doing 10 or 15 or 20 years in jail, if the public defender doesn't do an adequate job, why can't they be held accountable for the job they're doing? Mhm, mhm. Absolutely, absolutely. We just got just a few minutes left, everybody. So we're gonna start with Stephen. Stephen, uh, thank you so much for being our guest, and I'm pretty sure we're gonna have you back on the show again. But we want you to be able to share how the listeners can get in contact with you if they if they want to follow you on any of your Instagram pages or Facebook or. Um, you know, for any additional upcoming interviews that you would like to share, you can do that at this time. You can share with the audiences how they can be able to find you on social media. Well, as of right now, I'm only on Facebook. Uh, I just got out of prison last week on Thursday, so I've been out a week. Um, so uh, under uh, on Facebook, under Stephen Forrest um, is how you can find me. 
Uh, and uh, I'd be happy to hear from anybody that wants to um, know more about my experience or know more about my plan for prison reform and how we can mm-hmm. all get together and start making some real changes. Okay, perfect. Laura, you can be able to share with the listeners as to how they can be able to connect with you and your story. Yes, I'm uh, Laura Wetzel, 80 at gmail.com. And then I'm also on Facebook. And uh, congratulations, Stephen, for making it out. Mm-hmm. You too. <laughs> That's so awesome. Okay, Alan, you can be able to share with the audience as well as the guest panel how they can be able to um, find you, connect with you on your website, as well as um, uh, any other social media handles that you um, have. All right. Well, Diane, it was a pleasure to be with you again today. And I just want to say to Stephen, congratulations. Um, and uh, your voice is really powerful. And also to our other panelists today, uh, thank you so much for sharing your experience. It, it, both of you moved me tremendously and inspired me greatly to fight even harder for, for the rights of my clients. Uh, anybody who wishes to get in contact with me, the easiest way to do that, just Google my name, Alan, A-L-L-A-N, Friedman, F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N, criminal lawyer. Um, I'll come up as one of the first search results, or you can always call me at 203-357-5555. I'll be happy to help anybody with any, uh, we give free consultations, answer any questions any, anybody has. Thanks again, Diane, and have a wonderful 4th of July holiday, everybody. Okay, thank you. thank you so mu- thank you so much. And so also I would like to say congratulations to you, Stephen, for making it out and as well as for you, Laura, have to have um overcame a lot of um adversity while being incarcerated and as well I would like to also thank Alan for always being here for us on the broadcast, giving the audience tips, tools and resources and generalizing um, the things that we're going through and facing in the today with the 21st century in the criminal justice and uh, laws and reform. Again, this is Diane Winbush, your host, and so I will see everyone else back next Thursday. Have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you, Diane. Thank you.